This is lecture number eight and the final lecture in a series of eight tapes, lecture tapes on the doctrine of Satan. And we're now looking into the 16 deadly deeds of the devil. We've examined number 11 now, deadness. And we said that to suffer deadness is to forget the admonition in Hebrews 9, verse 14, and especially that one found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, where the apostle John hears these words. He says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. God is the author of life, and God desires that the believer today do what Adam once was told to do. God created Adam in his own image, and he said to Adam, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Become the king of creation. Now, when God saves a sinner today, he renews him in the image of Christ. And he desires that that saved sinner, and by the way, that's the only difference between a sinner and a saint, the Savior in the middle, and when he saves that sinner and makes him a child of God, then he desires that that sinner, that saved sinner as it were, reproduce himself, that he be fruitful and multiply, and to subdue the kingdom of Satan, literally. And so that's what God desires, but when a believer is dishonest and deceitful and dull, then he becomes dead and he does not do these things that God foreordained that he should do. So, number 12 now, delay. And of the various deadly deeds of the devil, this is certainly one of the most deadly, that of delay. I have heard Theodore Epps say in my hearing that many a man is in hell today that meant to get saved at the eleventh hour of his life, but who died at 1030. There's a lot of doctrines that uh, theologians have come up with, and we, uh, of course, are studying and will continue to study a number of these doctrines, the doctrine of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the doctrine of Satan, when we're studying now, and the doctrine of, of prophecy and the doctrine of the church, etc. But I don't know, maybe we really ought to come up with a much-needed doctrine that certainly could be systematized by studying the Bible, and that would be called the doctrine of today or the doctrine of now, or perhaps the doctrine, the antithesis of this, the doctrine of procrastination. Because the Bible has a lot to say about what you're going to do for God. Do it today. You see, God has never promised to either save a sinner or sanctify a saint tomorrow. Now, by sanctify, I mean to... Uh, you know, to uh, allow that saint to grow in grace, to become more and more like Jesus. And, uh, but he's never promised to do either of those things tomorrow, but only today. The Bible admonition is this. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The Bible command is this. Now is the accepted time. I may have mentioned this before. I have been really stirred uh, since a few years ago when I read a, a psalm for and saw a verse in a psalm for the first time. It sort of leaped out from the pages. And I refer to Psalm 90, verse 12, a psalm of, of uh, Moses. And he writes these words as a prayer. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And I think I brought this out also that every other week at the Thomas Road Baptist Church, I receive a paycheck. And then I take that check home, and like all uh, dutiful husbands and faithful husbands, I, obedient husbands, I give it to my wife. 
and uh, she begins to uh, number the shekels, as it were. She puts a certain amount of money on this side, and she says, uh, all right, in this pile, and she says, now this goes for our tithes and offerings, and then, and then another, uh, some more dollars are set aside for uh, our savings account, and then uh, for the house payment, and and for the uh, utilities and for our son's education, etc. In other words, we number our dollars that we might apply our bank account unto wisdom. Now that's fine, but here the psalmist says, teach us to number our days, not our dollars, but our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now what does this have to do with this deadly D of delay? Well, it simply means this, that you do not know you have tomorrow. And so you have only today to spend your time. And what you need to do is not delay those things that God wants you to do today and not delay them till tomorrow, because tomorrow may never come. To delay is to forget Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We all remember that terrible day. It was on a Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, about 1.30 p.m., and we received the horrible news that the President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, had been assassinated by a head wound in the streets of Dallas, Texas. And Mr. Uh, Kennedy was on his way in this motor caravan that he was in when he was shot to the Board of Trade building there in Texas and he was going to, in Dallas, and he was going to make a speech. And uh, a few days later, actually several weeks later, I guess, uh, I read the text uh, that he was going to speak on or speak from, I should say. Uh, it was printed in the U.S. News and, and World Report magazine. And uh, Mr. Kennedy, of course, was setting, uh, even at that time, uh, the political uh, machinery in motion for his election on down the road. And uh, But often in the text that he had written, uh, he referred to the future. And he said, we've done thus and such in the last uh, two years. Now in the next uh, year or so, we desire to see this done. And next year, I intend to do thus and such. Of course, Mr. Kennedy did not know that uh, he would never read that speech. He wrote it, but he would never read it because when it came time for him to read it, he would be in eternity. So to delay is to forget Proverbs 27, verse 1. All right. Now, the next deadly D, that of discord. To sow discord, and this is one thing God hates, since a deadly D is to forget Proverbs 6, 14, where the Bible says, that God hates that one who sows discord. In fact, the next few verses said these seven things God hates, a lying tongue and a proud look and all that, and he that soweth discord among his brethren. Someone has said, and it's certainly true, that far more churches have been broken up fundamental evangelical churches because of disposition rather than position. For example, here is a Bible-believing church that has a tragic split, and people won't speak to each other, and they actually leave the church and, and go to another church. Why? Is it because the pastor? Is it because the Deacons, is it because the Board of Elders has gone on record in saying, now, we're changing our position. We once believed in the book and the blood and the blessed hope, and we no longer believe in these things. No, very, very seldom does that happen. Does that break up a church because of doctrinal position? It is almost automatically, uh, almost always due to disposition. Someone 
be it the pastor or whoever, will sow discord in that church, a deadly D of the devil. And then, defi well, let me just say this about discord. The, uh, one of the first instances we have in the entire word of God of a man going to hell, going down alive into the pit, occurs in Numbers chapter 16. And in this particular chapter, uh, the children of Israel are in the wilderness, and uh, they're at the foot of uh, Mount Sinai, Jabal Musa, Mount of Moses, as the Arabs call it. And I thought of this passage when I took that Sinai Peninsula trip in the summer of 1974. And uh, at any rate, they were at the base of the mountain, and Korah, who was one of the leaders, an Israeli uh, leader, a very respected man, along with a group of other men, uh, became sores of discord. And they came to Moses, and they said, you're taking too much upon yourself. Well, Moses thought the same thing, and he really uh, wasn't too uh, anxious to lead God's people anyway, but God had chosen him, and that's all he could do is just do what God told him to do. And that's what he'd been doing. But Korah said, you're taking too much upon yourself. We're as holy as you are. Well, it was true in a sense. Of course, uh, all men needed to be saved, and Korah was, uh, Moses in a sense, was as much a sinner as Korah, but it, uh, spiritually, all men are the same, but ecclesiastically, God has chosen certain men to do certain jobs, and he chose Moses and not Korah to lead the nation at that time. So at any rate, uh, he was sowing uh, terrible discord, and Moses fell on his face before God, and he didn't know what to do, and God later on uh, told Moses what he would do. And the next day, the Bible says, and it's a it's a fearful passage in number 16 that God literally opened the ground. The ground opened her mouth and swallowed Korah and the causers of discord alive and they went down into the pit. All right, discord. And then the 14th deadly day of the devil, that of defilement. To be defiled is to forget, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You see, God cannot use a defiled vessel. The Bible says that God can only use clean vessels. He does not demand golden vessels. He does not require silver vessels. But he must have, he insists upon, clean vessels. So to be defiled is to be set on a shelf as far as God's concerned. To be defiled with physical habits or mental attitudes or whatever is to fall uh, to this 14th deadly day of the devil, that of defilement. And then the 15th deadly day, that of defame, or to defame someone. And to defame someone, defamation we should say, is to forget Psalm 101, verse 5. The Bible says, Who privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Uh, we have an anti-defamation league in America, and uh, this is a legal um, group of people, and they have certain goals and everything, and we may or may not agree with these goals, but, but God also desires his believers to join a spiritual anti-defamation league. And for that reason, I believe, because many people who claim to be children of God and maybe are saved, and, uh, but they, they forget, or that is to say they uh, do not uh, su submit their tongues to the Lord, as the book of James says, and they too, along with those that are defiled, because of their defamation of others, are set upon the shelf as far as God is concerned. You see, it's a terrible sin 
to defame someone else. And this was the first recorded sin of Satan. He was blackguarding God. Now, his first official sin, as far as the universe was concerned, of course, he, uh, his pride uh, caused him to uh, set himself against God. But his first recorded sin on earth, uh, we find in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And what he does here, he badmouths God. He defames God. He says to Eve, hath God said? You know, the animals are all talking about this, and I just can't believe that God, I mean, uh, he must have a reason for I can't believe he would do that, Eve. Did he really tell you that you could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So to defame is to forget Psalm chapter 101, verse 5. And of course, that is Satan's main job today. He has his own pro-defamation league. And what he loves to do is to defame Christians. And that's the reason, of course, for the uh, resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the final, the 16th deadly D of the devil is that of disobedience. To disobey is to forget 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. And of course, this is a passage dealing with the first king of Israel whose name was Saul. Many tapes back we attempted to contrast and compare the differences and the similarities existing between the Saul of the Old Testament and the Saul of the New Testament. And of course what we uh, saw on this occasion was that the Saul of the Old Testament was uh, from the tribe of Benjamin as was the Saul of the New Testament. The Saul of the Old Testament was a big, impressive man. The Saul of the New Testament was a small, unimpressive man. The Saul of the Old Testament, in his, well, actually, I should say, he began as God's friend and wound up as God's enemy. The Saul of the New Testament began as God's enemy but wound up as God's friend. And in the hour of his death, the Saul of the Old Testament went to the witch of Endor for help and comfort. In the hour of his death, the New Testament Saul went to the Word of God for comfort and for help. And the answer to these contrasts seems to be that the Saul of the Old Testament was disobedient whereas the Saul of the New Testament was obedient. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, the Saul of the Old Testament, Samuel tells Saul, he said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You see, Saul had determined that uh, he would keep the best of uh, the flocks of a certain city and he was to destroy these flocks by the command of God, but he didn't. And Samuel said, why have you disobeyed God? And he said, because, Samuel, I desire to keep them that I might offer some of these animals as a sacrifice. Well, of course, he wanted to keep the other 90% and that was the reason he spared him in the first place. But he was going to throw God a crumb, as it were, by saying, I'm going to sacrifice 10% of these animals. And then that's the background leading to this verse here. To obey God in the first place is, to better, is better than to sacrifice. Because the answer is, of course, the reason, if we obey in the first place, we won't have to sacrifice uh, in the second place. To sacrifice means one has sinned and he's offering something to take the place of that sin. So his sin in the Old Testament was disobedience. But the Apostle Paul in the New Testament once told a king in the book of Acts concerning his conversion experience and he said, and I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision O King. And that's the final statement now 
that we shall be making concerning the doctrine of Satan. Now, we have a few moments left, actually probably about 20, 25 minutes, and I'm going to do something. Recently, I preached a message entitled, If I Were the Devil, to the students of the college and institute and seminary at the Liberty Baptist Schools, and uh, uh, several felt it was a blessing, and what I thought I would like to do is summarize the remaining moments of this tape, that message. And I've taken it, and it'll sort of, in a sense, be a summary of everything we've said in the last seven tapes. So what I'm going to do now is to have the uh, young man dealing, uh, taking care of the tape, taping now, to shut off the tape, and then we'll uh, be back in about uh, 60 seconds, and I'll summarize in your hearing, in a way that I preached it, uh, that sermon entitled, If I Were the Devil. I'd like to speak to you on the subject, If I Were the Devil. Some time ago, a number of years ago, I read an article in a national magazine and uh, I wish I'd saved it. It concerned a very unusual department in our government. And this was different from all other departments of the government because the main job of the scientists and the philosophers and the politicians and the military men that uh, made up this department, their main job was to pretend like they were the enemy. And they were to use a little empathy, and of course that means the ability to put oneself in another person's shoes, and to ask themselves the question, now we know the Russians are attempting to take over our country, desire, have threatened, and promised to do this, and if we were the Russians, how would we go about doing that? What would we do if we were the enemy? When I read that article, I thought to myself, that's a very novel and helpful idea. I think that's a good suggestion. And sometimes it helps to put ourselves in our enemy's shoes and ask the question, what is our enemy thinking about? How would he approach getting at me? How would I approach getting at me if I were the enemy, that is? And uh, today I'd like to do a little spiritual investigating along this line because our enemy is the devil and he's been up all day and all night and he'll be up tonight even as we sleep attempting to defeat us, attempting to delude us, attempting to deceive us concerning his foul plans. What would we do if we were the devil attempting to get back at us? And I've come up with a number of things. Some may surprise you, but I assure you we can prove these by the Bible. One of the first things that I would do if I were the devil, I would ridicule my own existence. And, of course, we know that Satan is doing this today. There is a tremendous difference between God and Satan Above all else, God desires to be believed in. If you want to believe, if you want to please God, you must believe in him. Because the Bible says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But above all else, Satan enjoys being disbelieved in. So one of the things that I would do, I would attempt to ridicule, to downplay, or deny my own existence. All right, the second thing that I would do if I were the devil, I would carefully, but not prayerfully, read the Bible. And we do know that the Bible tells us that the devil does read the Word of God. And he reads it in order that he might pervert it, that he might take it out of context, and that he might know what his hated enemy, God, is up to. The third thing that I would do if I were the devil, after reading the word of God, I would understand his purpose, and God has a twofold purpose in this world today. Of course, the overall purpose is to receive glory to himself. 
to give honor to Jesus. But as far as the earth is concerned, as far as men are concerned, God has a twofold purpose. Number one, God desires to get sinners saved. And secondly, God desires to see saints sanctified. That is to say, he uh, desires to see them grow in grace after they get saved. If I were the devil, after reading the Bible, I wouldn't understand this purpose now. God wants to get sinners saved and saints sanctified. So I would do everything in my power to keep God, prevent God from reaching, from obtaining these two, or achieving rather, these two purposes of getting sinners saved and saints sanctified. How would I go about this? Well, concerning his goal of getting sinners saved, here's what I would do. Uh, one of the things, I would attempt to confuse him theologically, the unsaved person. I would send some uh, Jehovah Witnesses around to see him and let him read uh, that wonderful magazine, uh, Watchtower or Awake. Uh, by the way, some time ago I wrote a similar article in title with, uh, in fact, it had the same title, A Fire with the Devil, and it had some of these uh, thoughts that I'm speaking about today, and this was printed in the old, uh, the, uh, old time Gospel Hour newspaper. And at that time, it went out to about three or 400,000 people, and I, I got a very uh, uh, hateful letter from a, a lady who apparently was a Jehovah Witness, I guess you just never know who reads uh, newspapers these days. And, and uh, at any rate, uh, she wrote me a 10-pager, and so she began, Sir, well, you know right away you're going to get zinged when they don't even put dear or, um, or reverent or whatever. And uh, so she said, Concerning your recent shabby article entitled, If I Were the Devil, and then there was a hyphen she had made, a little mark on the paper, and she said, What do you mean? If now That was the first paragraph of the first page of a ten-pager. But I would confuse him theologically. I would send some Mormon missionaries around to talk with him and let him read the Book of Mormon. I would make sure that he turned uh, uh, on the radio and tuned in to that great Bible teacher, Garner Ted Armstrong, and that wonderful program, The World Tomorrow. Actually, Mr. Armstrong speaks of the world that never existed, or at the best, he speaks of the world the day before yesterday because he attempts to put the believer back under the law. But uh, I would confuse him theologically. I would invite him to attend a liberal church. In fact, I think I would discourage him from becoming a drunkard uh, or for becoming a murderer because I would like for him to remain a moral upstanding pillar of the community, I do allow him to do any of those things as long as I could confuse him theologically and keep him from accepting Christ. And then if I were the devil attempting to keep an unsaved person from accepting Christ, I would certainly play upon his emotions or upon his prejudices. I have a book here, or I have an article rather, entitled, Pastor Quits Sports. And I think it's very interesting. Some of the reasons, uh, 10 or 12 reasons, someone has come up with why this pastor quits sports. And I wonder if you've ever recognized any of these excuses. Number one, uh, the reason I quit sports is because every, every time I went, they ask for money. Secondly, the reason I don't go to football games particularly, the people with whom I had to sit didn't seem to be very friendly. Thirdly, the seats were too hard and not at all comfortable. Fourth, I went to many games, but the coach never one time came to call upon me. Fifth, the referee made a decision with which I could not agree. The sixth reason I don't attend football games, I suspected that I was sitting with some hypocrites. They came to see their friends and what others were wearing rather than to see the game. The seventh reason, some games went into overtime and I was always getting home late. Eighth, the band played some numbers that I had never heard before. Nine, it seems that the games were scheduled when I wanted to do other things. 
The tenth reason I don't attend football games is that I was taken to too many games by my parents when I was growing up. I sort of got soured on it. The eleventh reason is I recently read a book on sports, and now I feel that I know more than the coaches do anyhow. And twelfth, I don't want to take my children to any games because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like best. Do you ever recognize any of these excuses? The truth of the matter is, is that if we would offer uh, these excuses that many people offer why they don't go to church, we would offer them for not doing anything else in this life, it would be laughed out of court. But if I were the devil, I would play upon his prejudices. And then if I were the devil, attempting to keep an unsaved person from getting saved, I would involve him in good works. I would let him be involved in the Red Cross movement. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, but to keep him from the old rugged cross, you see. And I'd involve him in good works. And the next thing I would do if I were the devil attempting to keep unsaved people from getting saved, and I think I would really use this, I would tell him he had time. I might even allow him to believe that there is a God and that there is a hell and that he needs to be born again and that the Bible has the plan of salvation. And I might even allow him to believe that Christ can save him and that he should be saved. I'd let him believe all that. But I would tell him, you've got time. You've got time. There's a little poem that I often quote entitled, The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more but to lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. If I were the devil attempting to keep a un, an unsaved man from accepting Christ, I would tell him he had time. And then I would attempt to frustrate God's second fold purpose. Not only would I attempt to keep unsaved people from getting saved, but I would attempt to keep Christians from growing in grace. I would attempt to keep saints from being sanctified daily by the Spirit of God. Uh, how would I do this? Well, in a similar way that I would deal with unsaved people, I would attempt to confuse the Christian theologically. For example, I'd get him off onto tongues, into tongues. And if I could get him involved in speaking in tongues, uh, and seeking the gift of tongues, then he probably would not use the one tongue that he had. You know, not one single person was ever led to Christ by another person speaking in tongues. Not one single person. Not one single backslidden believer was ever brought back to the Lord by a person speaking in tongues. Not one heartbroken saint was ever comforted or instructed by a person speaking in tongues. Because, you see, they can understand another person speaking in tongues. And if I could get the Christian speaking in tongues, he would never win a soul to Christ, at least while he's doing that, he certainly wouldn't. He would never be able to instruct a young believer to find help find the will of God for his life he would never be able to restore a backslidden believer, and he would never be able to do anything else for any other believer or unbeliever. I would confuse him theologically, and I would get him off into tongues, I would get him off into Armenianism, I would get him to worrying about his salvation and wondering whether he uh, was once saved, always saved, because once he did that, then he wouldn't... Uh, uh, he'd be worrying so much about that that he wouldn't have time to win other people to Christ. Then I think I would not only confuse him theologically, but I would discourage him. Oh, how I would discourage him. There's a little poem that says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. But I have added another stanza and says, The devil glories when he views the strongest Christian with the blues. 
So what I would do here is I would discourage him. I uh, would uh, not let him read that passage in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are in prison. You remember at midnight the Bible says they were singing praises unto the Lord. Now, I don't know what they were singing. We don't have the exact uh, stanza recorded, but I know they were not singing what probably you and I would have been singing, songs like, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, or uh, songs like, It's Not an Easy Road, We're Traveling to Heaven. No, they were singing songs like, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. They were singing songs like, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. That's the songs that they were singing. But I'd keep him out of that chapter. I would attempt to discourage him. Uh, I've heard Jerry Falwell say this so often, and I'm sure all of the students have heard it too, so many times, God can never use a discouraged Christian. And I've also heard him say that God does not determine uh, the, uh, a man's worth by his eloquence or his education, but by how much it takes to discourage him. If I were the devil, I would discourage him. And then the third thing I would do if I were the devil in attempting to keep a saved person from growing in grace, I'd confuse him, I'd discourage him, and I'd anger him, I'd get him mad. Someone has said that a man is like a piece of steel. Both are useless when they lose their temper. It's also been said, in fact, I think uh, Henry Ford, an unsaved man, made this statement, and yet it's certainly true. He said, I wouldn't give a dime for a man who didn't have a temper. But, he said, I wouldn't give a nickel for a man who couldn't control the temper that he had. I'd get him mad. And then the fourth thing that I would do in keeping a saved person from growing in grace, I'd confuse him, discourage him, anger him, and I'd keep him idle. I'd keep him idle. You know, there are two kinds of uh, uh, critters in a church. Uh, someone has said, first of all, there are the pillars, two kinds of Christians. One is the pillar. They're known as pillars. And uh, they hold the building up. They're there Sunday morning. They're there for Sunday school, for the preaching service. They're there Sunday night. Uh, they're there Wednesday night, visitation Thursday night. And uh, if you had a meeting at 3 in the morning, they would be there. They tithe, they pray, they give, they witness. They are the pillars. And that's about 10% of the people. And the other 90% are the caterpillars. And they sort of crawl in and crawl out once a week or maybe once a month. But if I were the devil, I would attempt to keep the Christian idle. The little song certainly has a lot of theology that says, In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. You know, you take the word serve out of service, and you have the word ice left. Many Christians need to be de-iced or defrosted. And then the final thing that I would do if I were the devil, I would ridicule my own existence, I'd read the Bible, I'd attempt sinners from being saved and saints from being sanctified. The fourth and final thing I would do if I were the devil, I would viciously attack three basic divinely given institutions. The institution of marriage, the institution of human government, and the institution of the local church. I would understand from my reading of the Word of God that God has given these three institutions to help mankind find the will of God on earth. And I would viciously attack all three. I would attack the institution of marriage. I would be for no abortion laws. I would be for no contest divorce laws. I would be for no censorship laws. I would be for the gay liberation movement. 
I would be for everything that would destroy or weaken the beautiful relationship that God desires to be uh, to exist between a man and his wife. I would attack the institution of marriage. The second thing I would attack is the institution of the state. I would cause Americans to hate the American system of government. I would cause Russians to hate the Russian system of government. Now, as Americans, we look down upon the Russian system of government because it's communistic. However, let me just say this. It is as much a sin for a Russian believer in Russia to steal from a Russian official in their land to take something from someone else that's not theirs as it is for an American to do that uh, here in America because it's always wrong to steal. And I would uh, cause young people from all over the world to rebel and be guilty of anarchy against their own governments. And of course, during the street stomping 60s, the ROTC burning, building burning 60s, uh, we saw that not only in America, and they were not really rebelling against the Vietnam War. They were not rebelling against some of these other things. They were rebelling against the institution of human government. Certainly that is not to say that our government then could not have been improved. It certainly could have been. This is not to say that there were not or that there are not injustices in our government. There were and there are today. And I suppose there always will be. And we can, we can, we can violently protest as long as we do it peaceful like. But they were not protesting the Vietnam War. They were guilty of anarchy against the government of the United States of America, and at the same time, the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Russians, and other young people of other nations were doing the same basic things, or oh, for different reasons, stated-wise, but basically because they were the dupes and the victims of Satan, who was simply attacking the institution of human government. During that tragic uh, uh, killing of four uh, young people at Kent State in the late 60s, and what a tragedy that was, and everybody was blaming everybody, you know, and, and supposedly uh, there was a march around the White House. They were protesting uh, this slaughter of these four individuals. But do you know all the marches that took place during that uh, very uh, troubled weekend, I think uh, no one realized or no one marched against the fact that during that same weekend, which four were killed in uh, Kent State University, 17, more than four times the number, 17 young people the same age died in New York City alone from uh, using an overdose of heroin. Now, I didn't read any marches against that. Oh, no. No, this march against Kent State and all the rest, and there may have been, doubtless was some injustices there, but it wasn't basically because of that. It was because of satanic influence as the master of deception. Now we're using these young people to attack the institution of human government. And then the final of the three institutions that I would attack, if I were the devil, not only that of marriage and state, but the institution of the local church. Uh, I would try to convince Christians. I wouldn't even worry about unsaved along this line if I just get Christians confused in it, that the church was outdated, or that it was too big, or that it was too irrelevant, uh, that it was too impersonal, that it ought to be set aside for these buzz groups and these monologues and, and various other uh, things, substitutes for church worship service. These things I would do if I were the devil. One of the greatest songs ever written was written by a man 
at a time in his ministry when he was so oppressed with pressure from Satan that on one occasion he said he would actually pick up his inkwell and throw it at the devil because it would seem to him that the devil would be right there watching every word he wrote. I refer to Martin Luther and the great song that he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. With this we close this study. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing doth ask who that may be. Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. This is the final lecture on the doctrine of Satan. You may now take your final exam. This exam will be found in the final exam packet and should be taken in the presence of your proctor.